It is Tuesday night. It is 8 o'clock here in the great Midwest Central Time. Do you know where DJ's at? I know where I'm at. I'm here with you. Yes, it's another DJ roundtable. We have a couple DJs out on assignment, including one at DJX and a couple others doing other things. Again, we are working DJs and there's things going on. We have a guest DJ tonight, all the way from Wisconsin via Georgia, but that's okay. Uh, we'll show him lots of love here. And also, we want to hear from you guys out there. What do you guys want us to talk about? What you guys want us to, to uh, go over? And you guys have any questions, comments, critiques, criticisms? Put down below in the chat. Uh, we are live on Twitch. Uh, one thing also with uh, Twitch now changing the rules for DJing, um, I will be staying on Twitch doing the show on Twitch as well as on YouTube. But we won't be, I won't be doing music anymore on Twitch right now until that gets all figured out what's going on. They just came out with a new policy starting on the 8th and a lot of restrictions and so forth for Twitch. So I'm going to be staying off of Twitch for music wise, but the show will still be here and you can still catch the show live here on Twitch. If you're watching this on YouTube, do me a favor. First thing first, I want to thank all the new subscribers who have come onto the, uh, onto the channel. The second thing is that do me a favor, help me slay the algorithm, the YouTube beast that blocks everything and likes to say, hey, you just want to see you know videos about puppies and kittens. And you want to listen to and hear all the great stuff about DJs and DJ gear and all things affect DJ. Please hit that like button. Make sure you smash the subscribe button. And if you can, tickle the bell icon to make sure you know when a new episode drops i try and drop them on mondays at noon with that said i want to thank sean who is the guest dj this evening he's the first time on the show welcome sean and if you can tell everyone a little bit about your background like where i alluded that you're from wisconsin now in georgia if you can tell people what uh what's like moving from one state to another and uh what you uh what you do what what kind of stuff you like to do for djing yeah, awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, slow background. I got started about 12 years old in the business. My dad owned his own entertainment company. Um, so pretty much as soon as I was able to help haul around speakers, started working with him. Um, love music. That's why we all do it, right? It's my passion in life. So I've been fortunate enough now to do DJing full time, no other gig for the last seven years, I want to say. Um the last three of those years, we have been down here in Georgia, and it is crazy. Starting closed a successful company, um, started over from scratch, new website, everything down here in Georgia. And uh, like I said, we're on year three now, and just kind of starting to get back to where we were when we left Wisconsin. So, uh, as far as what we do, um, pretty much a little, little bit of everything as far as entertainment goes. Obviously, the DJ side of things, we do a lot of special effects, lighting, photo booths, and just pretty much that whole realm, realm of entertainment. And uh, one of the things also, uh, we were in a group chat together with Brentley, so we know all three of us know each other through the group chat. And I wanted to bring you on here because, again, you have a unique story, and we, we've talked plenty of times in group chat and stuff like that. Um and it's always fun, you know, picking other DJs' brains and, and seeing stuff and hearing stuff and seeing how people do things. Uh, but I, wa I wanted to get your uh, take on, now you said it took a couple years, you're starting to get back to where you were before, uh, moving from one state to another. Do you feel that that gives you advantage over local DJs because you're coming in with fresh eyes, you can look at venues, you can look at stuff differently than the people who have been there for quite a while, or... Do you feel it's kind of a disadvantage coming into a new market and not knowing the vendors and owners and stuff like that, knowing which photographer is great, which photographer is difficult to work with? Because unfortunately, you know, we've worked with difficult, you know, vendors, photographers, caterers, whoever it is, and we get to work with a lot of really great ones too. And then, oh, by the way, program note, I am going to have a photographer on here. Uh, I'm going to try and see about getting her on here for the next episode. Uh, that should be, but that's going to be the next thing. But again, going back to you, Sean, what do you think 
uh, how do you feel? What, what do you think was the big difference? You know, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it had its positives and its negatives with it. Um, obviously, you have no networking down here. So one of the first things we did, when even when we were looking for houses down here, um, we made up, we had some custom bags designed, had a bunch of promotional material made up, and we bought a bunch of stuff that's unique to Wisconsin. So some cheese curds, some cow pies, um, just different things that were unique to Wisconsin. And while we'd be down here touring houses, we started setting, setting up venue tours. So we instantly started reaching out to venues, introducing ourselves, meeting with them, talking about our background, what we offer, what sets us apart from their local DJs. Um, and we were able to get on several venue lists without ever even performing at them. Just taking that initiative to go out, meet with them ahead of time, check their venue out, and yeah. So, I mean, that was definitely nice for us. That helped us in the beginning um, get some gigs in. Um, the negative of it, you, again, we were a brand new business, no reviews. We had no online presence, none of that. So it takes so long to get all that built up, to get your SEO rebuilt up again. Um, I'd say that was one of the toughest parts of the transition. Um, and then music style, it's just weddings down here are four to five hours on average for us. Wisconsin, 12 to 13 hours we were pulling. Um, so it just completely changed the way I approach DJing my weddings. Um, and I'd say it's actually, it's helped me grow a lot better because now I do a lot more. I'll do a lot of quick mixing. And I will fill, if I have a five-hour event, I'm lucky to get two hours of that of open dance time. And that's a stretch. So I'm just, I'm pushing banger after banger after banger and just not letting off of it because I have such a short time to connect with the crowd. And that's, that's, that's one of the fun things is that knowing the difference between the two areas and how things are laid out and it, being Midwest, we know the way we'd usually do a wedding is usually, you know, on the reception side, you get the reception, the grand entrance, you go from grand entrance into cake cutting from cake cutting, you go into speeches, speeches into dinner or versus like on the East coast and also on the West coast, they go from grand entrance right to the first dance then they go into all the other stuff. And then a lot of times, uh, like on the West Coast, I know they take cake cutting and put that way after dinner versus most of the facilities here in Illinois and the Midwest. They want to do that because it's on the dance floor. They want to get that off the dance floor as quickly as possible so it's not in the way for the first dance and everything like that. So, again, when we do a grand entrance, it's grand entrance. You go right into cake cutting, then into kind of the speeches, blessings, and then go into dinner. So it's, I'm sure recalibrating things to kind of have that different mindset is kind of a, a unique take on it. Am I correct there, Sean? Oh yeah, definitely. And we do pretty much like the East Coast does. Um, it is grand entrance into first dance. Sometimes we'll knock out father, father, daughter, mother, son right away. And then and go into our blessing, our meal. And then it's having cake cutting after the meal speeches are back in there before after cake cutting depending the timeline um but you're definitely you're knocking most of your stuff off early in the evening which i love i love getting all of those formalities out of the way so when dinner's done it's time to party and that's even my approach for my dinner mixes um i used to not mix a lot during dinner time and i've totally changed that up and now I'll use the last half of my dinner. And that's when I'm playing a lot of your older wedding bangers and getting a feel to see what's resonating with that crowd during dinner time to then know what I'm going to open my set with when open dancing starts. So yeah, it's, it's literally completely changed the way I approach events. And that's the thing of looking at things differently than what you have in the past. And like one of the things I do, I just, I, I, I've been doing it for a long time, is that later half of dinner is doing more, I can't say aggressive, more up, I always do upbeat music throughout dinner, but usually it's slower in the beginning, 
and then get into ramping up to a little bit more faster. Like one of the things I've said before, Sweet Caroline, hard song to dance to, people love it. I'll throw it in the back half of dinner. You know, you know, basically yeah. right before dessert or something like that is served, throw that in there. That way it gets off, you know, the playlist. People love it. They sing along. If you got, you know, depending on the crowd, that's Amore, stuff like that. People that, that you know, they can kind of interact with it. And, you know, if they, they want to kind of dance a little bit, they can. But a lot of people ask for those songs. They look for those songs, you know, like, you know, you know like Brown Eye Girl and, you know, Brown Eye Girl, you know, again, some people don't like it, some people like it. It all boils down to what the crowd is doing, plus what the couple want to have for music wise. But if you could knock out some of those older favorites, you know, aunt so and so, uncle so and so, mom, dads, older siblings, older relatives, the older people there, they're enjoying it, they're having fun. The younger people are hearing it now, that you're not wasting, you know, time in a dance floor. That way you can kind of get still give play the older stuff in the beginning and have people having fun and take them on that trip, that journey throughout. But you're also having them, you know, again, when people leave uh, later on, usually the older people usually leave earlier, they walk away with great sense of music. And then that later half of the night on the dance floor, you can have those stuff that, you know, the younger group likes to have. You know, you can get into, you know, the fun stuff. You can get into a lot uh, newer stuff. Uh, that's, you know, a little bit more different than the beginning half, you know, so it, it's, it's one of the things I really feel that's a great balance to do with dinner uh, music is having that less half of dinner is having that uh, music in there. And I, I give you kudos for that because that right there is what I do. And that's, it, I feel it's a very, very smart thing uh, for that. And uh, was Brantley turning lights off? He's doing Morse code. <laughs> I think he heard SOS something. SOS no <laughs> help help I'm trapped in Wisconsin help <laughs> sorry I had to take a call from legends uh, no problem I, I, th I thought maybe your daughter yelled for you um but yeah so uh, in retrospective um are you happy you moved from Wisconsin down to Georgia oh that is a great question um I am if you would asked me a year ago, I'd have told you, man, I messed up. Should have never left Wisconsin. Why did we give that business up? Uh, um, to now where bookings are rolling in steady. Um, we're busy pretty much every week right now. Um, even like right now, summer's kind of a downtime in the South because it's so hot. We're still doing four events a month right now. Um, so... Yeah, right now, great decision. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear your success, and I'm glad to have you on the show, Sean. Welcome to the show. Uh, hope to have you on here some more because it's great insight you have. And uh, again, you compliment all the other great DJs that we have here. And I, I want to go over to uh, actually one half of the power couple in Indiana <laughs> and ask you, sir, uh, um, I know I can only give you half an answer. You don't have an answer. Oh, I said, I can give you on. half an answer. <laughs> okay. But I, I, I know that again, the market's different um, from our area. Cause again, you're in the Chicagoland area. It's different from like Wisconsin or, you know, Southern, uh, Northern Wisconsin or, you know, uh, Central Indiana. Have you ever traveled for a gig, you and your wife, or has she ever traveled for a gig you know of? And what was your experience traveling to another, if you did travel, what was your experience traveling to another market and doing a wedding in another market? I wouldn't say we traveled really out of the market. The furthest we've gone is probably Lafayette, which is only 80 miles. Was that so, different uh, though? Was, was there a more different feeling there in Lafayette versus your side of Indiana? No. Um, and as you explain your region, it sounds very similar. We do go into, or ha lately couples and venues have been set suggesting going right into the first dance right after grand entrance. But other than that, it's pretty laid out. It seems like the Midwest kind of does do it all the same, at least in our area. Because even when Brantley describes a lot of times, it seems like it's the same. But then, as we see, like with Matt and Sean, it is completely different. Would you, uh, would you, uh, 
would you object for someone to say, hey, let's, I want you to DJ in Iowa or I want you to DJ in Ohio or in Pennsylvania? Would you go out there? Yeah. For the right price. Well, of course, you know, they, I'm expecting yes, you to do it for yes, free. Yes, I, agree. <laughs> I would, uh, I would like that. I wouldn't be opposed to that. I'm always for something different. Okay. So you you have no problem whatsoever going out of the, the market and going into another market like Detroit or uh, Cincinnati or down to Columbus, Ohio or something like that. Or any, I know Indianapolis, Indianapolis is what, an hour and a half from you? Indianapolis is about three hours. Three but hours? Yeah, uh, I would go there. I've done a bar gig in Indy once, like when we first started because of a friend, right. but... That's a it, heck of a travel. <laughs> it was it was not my gig. I was kind of there to assist. A, I had a friend who lived down there in college. Ah, but okay. Yeah, it's about three hours. And that's the thing is that um, you know it, it's a good it's a good long ride. We want to make sure that you know you're you're traveling wherever you're traveling to. I'm gonna pull this down a little more to the mic. I don't know. Wisconsin uh, seems fun. If you guys want to invite me up there for a wedding. It can be fun. I mean, <laughs> drinking is the come to the, past come to the bar. Yeah, <laughs> there's a bunch of quivering livers in Wisconsin. They should change it from uh, the land of uh, uh, America's Dairyland to the land of quivering livers. Uh, <laughs> so, Sean, I gotta ask you this question: Since uh, you're the transplant, do you see more drinking down in the south or back home in uh, in Wisconsin? I would say eighty percent of my weddings down here are dry. No alcohol served. Um, and I think that's kind of what plays in to the shorter weddings down here. If you don't have that alcohol, you're not getting into that party mode. There's no reason for that, that three, four hour reception. Um, so I think I think the alcohol plays a big factor. And I'll say that's the one thing I miss about Wisconsin weddings is the party aspect of it. Wisconsin weddings are lit man <laughs> that's the best way i can use to describe it they things get wild in wisconsin especially when you start pushing that midnight hour or later um don't see that down here i don't have guys ripping their shirts off out on the dance floor anymore um it's just a lot more conservative and a lot more religious when it comes to weddings because we are in the bible belt very understandable, but I know Brentley has had a few weddings. I mean, where people drop pants. Serious. Sean could probably attest to this. In a Wisconsin wedding, if a guy hasn't ripped their shirt off, if there isn't somebody puking in a garbage can at the end of the night, as a DJ, we have to ask ourselves what we did wrong, because oh, yeah. ninety percent of my weddings wind up like that. I mean, it, if they don't get that route. I mean, there are exceptions. Like, if I know I'm getting into a very theater Christian based wedding, I'm willing to do do it because it's theater based, and I know they're all going to be into a certain kind of group of music and not be heavy partiers. But because they're theater singers and all that, they're going to get down singing and doing their theater stuff on the dance floor. So I'll do weddings like that. But when you take away that aspect of it, and you have a dry wedding, I. I've never successfully navigated a dry wedding. It's always flopped. Every single, and I've only done a couple, like three of them in my entire, you know, wedding career, but all three of them were just awful. So more power to you to be able to pull that off because I would be losing my mind. Indiana's so it wishy-washy. Is. It's either you're ripping off your shirts or just the most boring wedding ever. It's there's like nothing in between. I I gotta get I gotta get, I, are long too. Weddings up here. I gotta get uh I, oh, I gotta get Jordan and Taylor to come to one of my weddings and uh have them hang with me on one of the days they're open because uh some of the weddings I have are pretty interesting. The the last uh not the last one, one before last, that ended up with uh, guys taking their shirts off um second to the last song because of the song itself. And that was a uh, song that goes back to them for college, but the, I, I will say that there's some pretty good amount of drinking at uh, most of the weddings I do. Um, we do get, you know, sometimes some of the little little sloppy stuff, but most of the time people are, you know, they, they're they're toasty. Uh, not as crazy as in Wisconsin or not on uh, Code Blue Cam. You know, we always talk about that. 
Uh, that's more or less, I think, not the people going to the wedding or at the wedding for uh, Brentley, but the people just in lacrosse in general, uh, they have a lot of uh, uniqueness up there. And um, I don't think it's, it's the alcohol. Just it's, so, it's not just lacrosse. Honest to God's truth. If you take, you can take Milwaukee and Madison out of the Wisconsin equation and everywhere else I've done a wedding outside of those two cities in Wisconsin have been always are 90, like I said, 99.9% .9 of the time, just absolutely nuts. Even the one I did at like Green Bay Distillery during the garter toss, the groom was stripping before he went down to get the garter belt off. And I'm like, and you would think even in Green Bay being the more working class city, but a big city, they would, you know, take some of that Milwaukee and Madison motif and be like, no, we can't have any of that. Because there's a venue up here like in Madison. Sean's probably done it. The field's reserved. You pull anything like that in there. They are stopping the wedding until the person puts their shirt back on and goes home. But you do – what, and like I said, what flies anywhere else but those two big cities here does not fly there. It's not normal for wedding behavior. And that's that's the interesting thing. I know Tommy, you've you've spent some time in, in the great state of Wisconsin doing some gigs. Plus, you do gigs down here in the Chicago area. Um, what, what what do you know? It's a big difference when you're up there versus down here. Besides the drinking level, what else do you ever notice between uh, one area and another area? Uh, I mean, from a bar perspective, playing at some of these spots in Wisconsin, I I would say they're more fun. Like people are just out to have more fun compared to uh in chicago i don't know if it's just because of more drinking or what it is but like i definitely feel like all the spots that i've played in wisconsin are like very high energy like people are always singing like they want to be out there having a good time and then like in chicago a couple of the spots i've played at are more uh like low-key people more just socializing amongst their friends rather than like being amongst like a huge uh, dance floor so I don't know that's something I've noticed but then uh, also too just like there's big variations from city to city like I've played in Milwaukee I've played obviously I play in Green Bay all the time and then like this last weekend I was out in lacrosse at uh, Legends where Bretley is always at and um, like there's differences from city to city there's some songs that work better in some places like some crowds react differently to uh, the way that I play, like if you're using the mic, if you're mixing a certain way, like there's things that you pick up on as you continue through your set and then you kind of base the rest of it off of what you what you observe. And that that's that's one of the things that is always interesting. I know one of the DJs that listen to this on as a podcast, um, he is in. Um, Pennsylvania, uh, basically New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, but he does a lot of gigs back toward more toward New York City area. And I, I, I next time I see him, I got to ask him, is there, you know, because he's done a lot of uh, gigs out in his area where he moved to, but he still once in a while has to do them, you know, further east. Has, does he see a difference between the two areas? Because you have a more rural area where he's living now, you know, he's he kind of living in more of a relaxed area. Versus when you get closer and closer and closer to a major metropolitan area, um, I'm sure there's a big, huge difference. And I'm sure that, uh, Tommy, you've seen a difference between, you said, between just, you know, different areas of a state. And I'm sure Brentley has seen that uh, as well. And, you know, Sean, again, he's gone from one world to a whole nother world that he had to get used to that, again, he said he was having parties and having fun, people, you know, doing things for hours and hours and hours versus, down there, it's it's a whole different world. Uh, one of the things, Sean, going back to you, with the uh, the difference between the two markets that you're in, um, people always talk about price. People always talk about money and stuff like that. And I know that sometimes you have to adjust things for the market. Now, I'm not talking about when you first got there, you're trying to break into the market. It's harder now that you're a few years in. Are you at where you were charging at Wisconsin or are you more the same or, or less as far as I'm asking how much you charge, but if you had a look at, you know, dollar for dollar, if you charge X in Wisconsin, are you charging X in Georgia or you charge a little bit less, you charge a little more. What did the market change now that you're settled there in uh, Georgia? 
Yeah. So I just got done actually doing our 2025 sales guide for clients and my pricing going into my 2025 sales guide is the exact same as when I left Wisconsin. But again, it took me three years to get back up to that point where I was at. Um, and I'd say another big thing down here is a lot of people are not getting that rate. There are a lot, there's a lot more competition with Atlanta. You were talking the amount of DJs that are down here is far superior to what was in Wisconsin. Um, and you see all the time you have tons of DJs biting at a lead that's trying to pay $500 for a wedding. And a lot of that just goes into knowing your worth and knowing that there are clients out there who are going to pay your rate. Um, so there's definitely, there's a big, big margin in the market down here. Um, and yeah. And that's one of the things also, I, even like here in the Chicagoland area, again, I got two other DJs here in the Chicagoland area, both Tommy, he's originally from Lyle, which is not far. And, you know, actually three, uh, four, D, uh, four, D, um, four DJs total, including myself, are Chicagoland, Taylor and Jordan. They're both just in Northwest Indiana across the border. Um, the four of us, you know, again, we know each other. Uh, we've talked to each other. The thing is that we, you know, we're in a major market. There's tons of DJs here. And I think that all four of us, and I know uh, Taylor and Jordan, you know, they have one company and they, they do the same thing, is that they charge like you're doing, charging what you're worth. Yes, they're always going to be the cheaper DJ. There's always those people. It's kind of looking at, at retail. There's always going to be people at Walmart. Walmart traps everyone. Walmart will be packed. And then you'll have that special boutique across the way that is not as busy. You still got shoppers there. They're a higher price. And that's a clientele that you should be looking at is that clientele is going to pay you what you're worth. It, it, do you, if you want to get in that battle, and I tell, I talked about this to other DJs, if you want to get in that battle, the race to the bottom be the lowest, you can do that. If you want to, that's your business. You could charge whatever you want to. You want to charge a dollar for a wedding. You want to charge a million dollars for a wedding. But I always feel DJs should charge what they're worth. And again, they work very hard at, they do a very hard job and you should walk away making a few dollars. You should never walk away saying, Hey, you know what? I just did it. And you know, the other thing also, there's some DJs, you know, who um, are part-time DJs. They don't have a full-time business. Um, they have their regular full-time job. They don't treat this, even uh, DJs who do have a full-time job, don't treat this as a business. They treat this as like beer money. And you see that every so often with some DJs who are not, you know, they're, they, they're not doing a full-time or they don't treat the business as a full-time business. I, I know uh, Jordan and Taylor, they have uh, other stuff going on, but they treat their business as a business. And that's why they're successful at it. Um, and, you know, Brentley and I do it full-time, you do it full-time. It's a difference in mentality. And I think there are DJs out there, uh, you know, a, a minority, uh, but there's a, quite a few of them that, you know, they go out and they, they charge you $200 because they're making so much money in a regular job. They just look at, hey, I bought some gear. I'll go DJ this this party or this wedding. I could charge $300. It's just beer money for me. And that's the difference between those, like, weekend warrior DJs that are more of a – um they do it for fun. And again, that's, that's great if you want to do that, but you don't have a business versus we have a business. And I think there's a, there's a difference between the two. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. If you, you know, you're doing stuff, you're having fun with it. Hey, great. But the thing is that us as a full-time DJ looks at it and goes, okay, if they want to do that, they want to market themselves as the, you know, this DJ does that. God bless. There's plenty of people out there. Even in the market that's saturated, there's always difference between DJs. And I think really feel that if you differentiate yourself from your competition and show why you're different, hey, I do this, this, and this, versus everyone else here does not, I think that really helps just have you as a standout between what you do and what other people do. And that's a big thing. And I'd like to just chime in again on kind of that point. Um, when you're starting so low, say – People are looking for $500 DJs. You come into the market at, say, $795 or something. The clientele that is looking for that DJ is price shopping. 
So I think that actually leads you to less bookings because then they're just going to take the bottom of the barrel because they are concerned about one thing, and that is price. When you up those prices and you get into the higher clientele, price isn't what they're looking for. Obviously, everybody has a budget, but that's when they're really going to start looking to see what it is you bring to the table and if you are the right fit for them. And it's not just about, do you fit my budget? Um, so that's that's just one thing I've noticed throughout the years of changing my price around. Um, and I think we get actually better, more qualified leads now being at that higher price than when we were competing with the, I say, bottom feeders. Um, when we first, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them bottom feeders. I would prices. just call them, I would call them, I would call them a budget DJ. And even, yeah, and that, that sound bad. We have Hunter is more of a lower price, a lower price DJ. He has a, cause of his market, his area, he charges what he feels is best for him and nothing gets Hunter. It's not, he's a bottom feeder. It's just that again, he wants to charge a certain rate and charge a certain price. And that's great. He wants to run his business. He, again, he could charge a dollar. He can charge a million dollars. It's his business to run and do that again. As a is Hunter a competition? You know, to me, no, he's not in the same market. But if he was my next door neighbor, he would. You know, he technically he would be my competition. First thing first, I would make him my friend because I like the guy. That's why he's on the show. He's a great guy, just like you, Sean. If you were my other neighbor, I'd make you my friend too. <laughs> And just like, you know, Jordan, just like Taylor, just like everyone, uh, Tommy, I like making friends and everybody knows that. And everybody sees that it's, it's great. But the thing is that when you, um, when you go do stuff and you, you look at those lower price DJs, again, they're doing what they feel is best for them. Do I want to do the same thing as them? No. And again, I, I totally agree with you. And again, I wouldn't call them bomb feeders. Let's call them the more lower budget DJs. And again, there's high end DJs that are, charging twenty thirty thousand dollars and they'll take a you know a room and put this big huge trust up there and huge led panels and all this other crazy stuff and charge six seven ten grand for in Quintanero or for a wedding and they do all this crazy stuff they have a staff they bring you know a bunch of trucks with lifts so it all boils down to what you want to do and again and those clientele who want to do the million dollar wedding are smaller than the, D the DJs who want to do you know the bigger weddings and we just lost Hunter. Um, but the thing is that with anything like that, you always want to look at what, what people bring into, to bring to you. And again, Hunter, who, again, it's a, it's a lower price DJ. He brings something here because again, there's DJs like him. And again, I, I don't, I don't blame him for what he charges. I, I, I applaud him. I don't blame any DJ what they charge. I applaud every DJ here. And again, you need to make what work. And I'm glad to see Sean that it works for you in your business and you have a plan to go against your competition. And that's the other thing a lot of DJs don't have is how do I compete against other DJs in the area? And not, and not just friendly DJs like, hey, you know what, dude, you want this, uh, I, I, you're, you have other competition that are DJs to do whatever, I do this, how do I compete against them? And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you say that. Um, I'm glad that you're, you're, you're doing good too. Um, Cool thing, Hunter. I know again, like before, I know that you're more of a budget uh, friendly DJ. When yeah. you do stuff, uh, when you look at stuff, have you ever DJed in another market, or are you just DJ there? I know you do a lot of friends and family, but have you done anything yeah. like oh, in North yeah. North Dakota? Yeah. Mm, nah, no. I mainly stick with family and friends only, and um, being a fellow, you know, East Coast DJ, I have seen people take their shirts off at a wedding because they got too drunk because we have an open bar. We're down home country rednecks here in Conway. And yeah, it's quite different between here and then, you know, Georgia because, you know, we're on the same coast. So, yeah. And of course I did, I do charge a little lower price, 50 an hour. And it's been the same way since I became a DJ in 2018. I haven't done a, wedding in like three years or two to three years since 2021 so it's been but you got some slow. gigs coming up my dude and you, you've done other gigs only one. only one not until that's one more than zero yeah the end of september i got a wedding it's gonna be a a wedding for a friend of mine from school and 
she's getting married on the 29th at the blessed barn where I've DJed before. And hopefully we don't make the same mistake with technical issues. You'll work then, through uh, it. I know you will. Cause you uh, are, you are a yeah. great DJ and you are very prepared for stuff. Uh, one of the things anyway, also, um, Sean, how far are you away from Conway, uh, uh, South Carolina? South Carolina. I have no idea. I mean, I'm in the just a little north of Athens, so you might have a little better insight. How far is how Athens far from, you? from you? Cool thing, Hunter. He's got to nice. look. <laughs> that, that's what I'm doing right map. now too. Yeah, I got to look at my map. Uh, it's about five hours. Five yeah. hours. Okay. I thought maybe you're a little yeah. closer. Maybe one day you guys can hook up yeah. and have lunch together. I was gonna say. And if you ever do, if you get a chance to be in there and you want to hook up with Hunter and uh, have a, a talk with him, he's a great guy. Uh, the one thing he likes, I will tell you two. Oh, I'll tell you two things he likes. One, he likes coffee, Dunkin' Donuts. You know, you make sure you get him. You know, uh, you take him, meet him at Dunkin' Donuts, and get him a coffee. And the second thing he likes is talking gear. He's a gearhead. <laughs> Love it. So if you like talking gear, like the, we do here in the show, and you want some to talk to, and you don't mind spending a, you know a little bit of a ride and getting a cup of coffee, Dunkin' Donuts is the place to go. And then you know it's it's you know buy him a coffee, and you guys can talk about gear. He will tell you all about his Mixstream Pro. He will tell you about his speakers he uses, and he's very proud of what he does. And uh, I, I don't know if you're subscribed to his YouTube channel. Uh, he's a great guy. Has some great YouTube content, and it has stuff. And if you guys out there have not done so already. Subscribe to his channel. Go over there. All the links are down below for everyone's channel here. I'm still trying to get uh, Taylor and Jordan to uh, do a YouTube channel. Uh, hopefully, they'll be doing that sometime soon. And uh, Jordan, oh, Jordan wanna, just ran away. Yeah, I want to add something to it. Like with when when I do a wedding, yeah, it's kind of like similar to Georgia, where we get like the ceremony first. We do our formalities. Actually, yeah, we do. Let's see. Let's, I lost my train of thought. We do ceremony, grand entrance, dinner, cocktail hour, what cocktail hour, dinner. We do our formalities, then we do the open dance. And down here, we like country music, a little bit of hip hop. We like a little bit of everything. We even like some of the more modern country music, like Jason Aldean, Luke Bryan, all that more modern country stuff. Hardy, that, Hardy's been a great one for the country dance floors. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing is knowing your music, too, because every area is a little different. And I can see, you know, down in, in Georgia, I can see if you're getting closer to Atlanta, I can see more pop, hip hop, and we're a little more rock. But if you're down, you know, you're out a little further out in the sticks, you know, out in the farm country, you're probably dealing with a little bit more country and, and older rock. You know, you're doing like 80s, 90 rock. You're doing some of that fun stuff. And again, knowing your clientele, working with your client on music, that's the important stuff. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, Brentley here for a really quick one. Um, since, you, again, you've moved from major market down to a smaller market, uh, and yet you are not a cheap DJ. You are you you charge, you know, basically uh, what you charge in a major market. What do you feel your biggest disadvantage is being expensive in a small market? Honestly, I don't want to sound arrogant, but there isn't one. There, honest to God, isn't one. And yeah, seven years ago, I was I was one of the DJs charging six, seven hundred bucks for a whole day to make sure I paid my bills, but. Now that I'm in this position where I'm, I think I am the high, one of the highest priced DJs in the state, if I'm not mistaken, and definitely the highest priced DJ in my market. One, and when I say there, it's what for starters, every lead that comes to me is qualified. And it's my response, my job at that point to make sure I book them or and sign the lead. And if I'm not, then I'm doing something wrong. And part and parcel with that, because of how much I'm charging, people also, one, value their entertainer and their entertainment. And know the quality of what I'm going to produce for their day is not going to be anything close to that $500 DJ. 
So we're not competing with you. They're not that 500 DJ, a thousand dollar DJ's couple is not my couple. Can I DJ their wedding? Of course I can. And are there times that, you know, if it is slow or going into the slow season, well, I cut a few deals. Oh, you're damn right. No questions asked, especially if it's at a venue I love to be at or a venue that's literally a three minute drive from my house and it's only a five hour day. So I'm willing to work with couples and all of that, but 90% of my weddings are easily seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars and up. And they those couples understand what the DJ brings to the table, what are not, and it's not just based on, oh, you use RCF speakers. Woohoo. Your atypical customer doesn't care what brand of gear you're using across the board. What they care about is your customer service, your attention to detail, making sure every aspect of the day that you have your hands involved with operates perfectly. And if something goes wrong, yours or somebody else's fault, you're able to not just recover, but make it go seamlessly without anybody knowing. So, and that's what couples are willing to pay 1800 to like, like I said, a couple of weeks, I've signed my biggest package a couple of weeks ago at $4,600 for one night. And they were very, they're like, the reason we want you, we want you doing the EDM club thing from 10 o'clock until 2 a.m. on our wedding. Cool. And they've got me booked for 16 hours that day. Like, when I say 16 hours, I'm my ceremony starts at 2, but with everything they want, they ordered the big light show and everything else along with it. I get me and the I'm actually bringing an assistant on for the first time ever for this wedding, but I'm going to be on by like 9 30, 10 a.m., and I'm not going to leave until three or four in the morning easily. So, hand in hand with that, they know what they want, and that is my ideal perfect customer. They say, you know, and most of the customers that will reach out to me on my site will go, we want your silver package, but can you add cold sparks to that? We want your bronze package, but we want up lighting. They know what they want out of me and they want me. So it's not, you know, necessarily the gear. At Did he freeze? I think he froze. <laughs> All right. He, we'll yeah, give him a second back. here. There you go. Am I back? Okay. You, you're back. But yeah. Now, uh, oh, he froze when again. Mitch Taylor got in my head that it's not about your gear. You keep freezing. Uh, really quickly, uh, have you seen more places saying no to cold sparks? Right. Oh, no problem. It's interwebs. The interweb gobs are mad for whatever reason. Uh, have you seen more and more places saying no to cold spark? Oh, yeah. All right. All right, Tommy, go ahead. Yeah, I'll see you later. Okay. Yeah. Dave? No. See you later, Tommy. Down here, I'm seeing more and more places saying but no the to venues Cold Spark. That want, the venues that wa are allowing Cold Sparks, one, no matter what, I touch base with them to make sure they haven't changed the rules. And two, I will ask the venue manager, what extra insurance do I need for you to operate those in your venue for that day? As soon as I have that, I am on the phone to my insurance agent getting an update for that one one day and yeah my insurance did my rates did go up a little bit this year but i think it's because of how often i'm actually tapping into them i need a i need a writer for this i need something for this day i need you to add an extra yeah. million dollars and include x y and z corporation so this is th this yeah, is so why having an insurance agent this is why having a good insurance agent is important to have because when you call him or her in my case to her uh, and saying, hey, I need this, this, and this, this, it's good having a hotline. And uh, Jordan, are you seen by you, uh, you know, again, I know you do this in the South Suburbs um, and you with Indiana. Are you seeing a lot of places saying, uh, more and more places saying no to Cold Sparks or are they, are they so cool with Cold Sparks? Honestly, I have no idea. I have never been asked Okay, I've been asked one time to do cold sparks. I don't have any, and uh, anyone I've worked for have only we've ran them once for someone else. Um, 
but I've honestly not even really seen them at other people's weddings around here. Like they just have not come here yet. Like very few people are even asking for them. Yeah. So I, I know I, I, it's hard to say because I don't even, I don't see them in any social media of any real other DJ in my area. Um, one person, yeah, like I said, I work for another DJ. Um, and he did them once, but yeah, he rented them because he didn't have any. And he, yeah, I was like, I've never been asked this before. So I just don't think they've really come to Indiana yet or pe people don't, I don't really, I don't really like them, but it's not my wedding either. So nope. And but th I don't have them. I don't really suggest them. I think, yeah, we got one call one time and we just kind of told them no. I, I, I don't have That's them either. Wanted, I don't though. I don't use them. But the thing is that, you know, talking to managers all the time, I had a couple of man facility managers go, you don't use Coast Parks, right? I'm like, no. And they're like, yeah, we're we're not allowing them anymore in our facility because we've had problems. I think it's the dust and the dirt from them more than anything because uh, a lot of DJs don't Coast clean Sparks. up. And if you're using Cold Sparks, number one, and this is why I avoid having to actually clean up the crap, I've got a four foot by four foot mat underneath my sparks. So as soon as I'm done, I don't have to vacuum anything. All the dust is falling within a foot around the thing. And if a couple errant sparks, because these things, I get it, aren't perfect. Occasionally, the powder gets goopy and gets a little sparky and holds the spark. But I'm, I'm sorry, you have to be able to clean it up when you're done. And with the four foot by four foot rug, Take the spark machine, put it back in the box, take the rug up, roll it out, roll it together, and take it outside and dump it in the dirt. You're done. And I even keep, you know, I have a small little, uh, you know, shot back, which is a one-gallon shot back that I can run out if I really need to and screw up. Or I've also got, you know, a little broom and dustpan in, you know, in my setup, as, in my gear as well when I bring those out. It's one of those handheld things. So I can literally pull it out the case and clean up any mess I make. And if your DJ isn't doing that, then they're doing a disservice to their couple and to the job or the name of a DJ. Cause that's, you know, just because we're doing it doesn't absolve us from the back end of it. Just like we are meticulous in our sales process and all the back end of the work we do. That is also something we need to be meticulous with. Well, the, we do. Uh, the, the other thing also is, uh, I, again, I don't have a sparkler, but you know, I I actually have I have a regular full size Dyson. By the Dyson, little battery operated, you know, for quick little things, especially with the dog with hair. Um, it's nice to have that to zip up little things. I think uh, Jordan Taylor, you got a little stick vacuum. Yeah, it didn't last long. I have nothing good to say about it. We replaced oh, no. the battery twice, and then the motor burnt, and I only had it like two years. What what brand was it? The Dyson. Really? Yeah, the eight minute one. Nothing but bad luck. It actually uh, started smoking in my wife's hand, and she kind of uh, got burned. Ah. Did you take it back to Did you take it back to Dyson? No. Oh, see, <laughs> Dyson threw it away. Dyson has repair centers, and Dyson repair oh, centers, they will they they will move heaven and earth because I that's where I bought our stuff from, and they. They take care of you. I did not they, know that. Yeah, they have repair centers. I think there's I think there's one at Orland Park. So it might be a little bit of a ride for you. There's not one really close by me either, but it might be that you know a half hour, 45 minute ride to the Dyson Center. You call them up and you brought you bring it there and drop it off. It might it, it might be useful because you know they may say, hey, you know what? This is our fault. And uh, we're not going to charge for repair. I've done it with a couple things with Dyson. Um, I have the Dyson. I actually have one right here, and I've one in my living room. The Dyson fan air purifiers. I buy the filters from there. We had one of them was not connecting the internet. Took it into them. Uh, the guy had for about 15, 20 minutes. Said, okay, see if this works. And, that, and we've had it now. Uh, we got them in 2020. Because we both, Trace and I both suffer allergies, not because of the bad stuff, just normal allergies. And it does help in the house. It also camps down to dust a little bit with the dog fur and everything like that. But the thing is, that, again, I've had it now uh, four years and she took it in and they're like, oh, you know, they blew it out. They went through a couple of things like, okay, try it out. 
no charge. Hmm. I was like, and again, that 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 sold me on dice and far as their how they take care of stuff. And again, they will repair things and fix things, but they see something that's their fault. Their first is fix it and not charge you. I definitely would call. And if, them. And if anyone's listening from Dyson, Buddy is looking for sponsors. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you guys got to remember out there in, in in the world. I do this for free. All the editing and stuff you guys see before on YouTube, the music added in, po in posts and afterwards, and editing it out sometimes when uh, uh, Matt uses colorful language and stuff like that. I do all that in post. So it's one of the things that I appreciate all you guys out there watching it. And I appreciate everyone here who is on the show. I can't thank everyone here. Uh, without them, I wouldn't have a show. And I thank everyone every, every week, giving up their time to come in here. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Taylor's out. Uh, she's working tonight. Uh, but, you know, Jordan's always here is solid. And uh, I know both you guys are having fun. I know uh, Hunter has fun here. Uh, Brentley always has fun. And uh, Sean, it's your first time you having fun on the show. Yeah, man, great. And that's the thing is that we, we this is our hangout here. And hopefully, if you're listening yeah. to this on as a podcast, or you're watching it on your uh, your phone, or on TV, or tablet, or computer, that hopefully helps you out a little bit and gets you some ideas and some thinking how to do things, how to make yourself a uh, a better in the business and maybe help you grow your business. And that's what it's about. It's not about who's right, who's wrong. And again, you see different DJs on here talk about different things, different areas, different markets, different pricing. And that's what it is. It's, 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 it's a friendship. It is a brother and sisterhood. It is, um, you know, the clan of the DJ, you can say, and that we're all together as DJs with um, each other and having fun. And just sharing ideas and talking about stuff. And unfortunately, we have a couple of DJs were down tonight, but things happen. Life's there, and uh, they'll be back again. And we, again, we have a lot of great insight here. Uh, I'm going to go back to Hunter real quickly. Um, and this is going to be a yes or no question. And I'm going to start with you on the yes or no question for uh, this round uh, here. And uh, it's it's a I like to do this, and Sean hasn't had this before to him because he's the first time here in the show. But I always ask yes or no question. There's no right or wrong. Does if you say no or yes, doesn't mean he's a bad person or anything that. Uh, but here is a very quick question for you. With it being toward the end of summer and school starting up soon, and so forth, and so on, are you looking at school dances at all? Are you trying to market towards school dances? And I know Hunter, you've done some stuff for your church with the kids and the youth groups. Yeah. Have you talked yeah, to like, yeah. the pastors about it? Um, n well, not really churches, churches, but I have I've done a couple of school dances. Back in April, I did Carolina Forest Elementary for their fifth grade glow night, and they had a good fun, had a great time. And I DJed for a Christian school, comedy, uh, I think it was Christian Academy in Myrtle Beach. They had a fun time with a whole bunch of requests and stuff. So I am... Yes, I am looking towards school dances when the school year starts back up. Okay, good, you good. You did a lock-in, right? Huh? Didn't, didn't you do a lock-in at a church? Oh, yeah. Overnight? Yeah, Dominion Church. That was years ago. Wow. I haven't done one since. Yeah, I haven't done one since. I, I think you should do another one. I think you should talk to the yeah. pastor there. Yeah. You know, or a rabbi, a priest, or whomever it is yeah. for the wor house of worship you're nearby or you're associated with and yeah. ask them. This is a perfect example how you can get some more business because, again, school startup is right around the corner. This is the beginning of August. In some areas, yeah. the end of August starts school. Uh, in other areas, it's the beginning of September. So you might want to yeah. put that in your radar. Uh, Jordan, for you and Taylor, have you approached any schools yet to uh, put your feelers out if you do school dances? For, like, high school, they uh... – the guy I work for does them, so I can't really uh, approach on that. But um, we do do some of the elementary schools in the area, but they're not nothing crazy. It, you know, they're not having the big homecoming or nothing. Just little things for, like, the different grades. Mostly, like, fifth grade stuff because they're the ones who have, like, the dances. But, uh, no, we haven't really reached out to any, especially because the one I can't really approach on. But, uh. 
I want to get into school dances, but I just I haven't yet. And we're kind of on one lane right now and kind of doing that. So um, until, you know, we get settled on that lane with buying the business last year and kind of joining everything together. We're, you know, trying to walk before we run. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the high schools have their guys who are seasoned veterans who've been doing it for 15 years that are doing a great job right now. So there's and that it's too. good to have a relationship with the, with those guys, because when they can't do it, they have you. And maybe uh, maybe you oh, know, yeah. someone someone retires or someone says, hey, I don't want to do it anymore. And then you have more growth for your business and uh, you can step into that area because you already have experience in it, which is good for you. I would say starting to work for other DJ companies hourly, just as like DJ assistants, running photo booths, all that has been more the best experience, help, mentor, whatever you want to call it for us than anything. I mean, that's the reason we ended up buying how sweet it is um, and what we've learned and all that. So, well, like, like I said before, I got, I got to have, uh, both you and your wife come out and uh, join Tracy and I at a wedding and have fun at one one of these days because uh, we we awesome to have you there. I, I get I get to chat I get to talk to uh, both Jordan and Taylor at a, a wedding show, and it's always fun talking to them and having fun with them, hanging out with them. But uh, it's all it'd be great to, to DJ with them too. DJ Bradley in Wisconsin, have you been looking at any or because of the I clubs think- and everything else? You just don't do the schools. I do not. I do not do school dances. I do not do all ages events, period. Clubs, weddings, and weddings are the only all ages events I'll touch. Outside of doing the special needs uh, organization I devote my time to. But that doesn't necessarily qualify as dealing with, you know, high school and grammar school kids. Out of the question, I'm not a babysitter. I've got my own kid to deal with. I don't want any of the headaches that go hand in hand with prepping a set, going through the back and forth of the principal or the person running it about music. Forget all that. I have no interest. I would rather, and I don't want to sound like a cocky, arrogant person. I would rather go scrub toilets at McDonald's than DJ high school events. <laughs> <laughs> they could be, they could be challenging. I, I've, I've only done a handful of schools, and that is. Uh, you know, we try to give back to local community. Uh, we don't market for schools. I don't, I don't, that's the thing. I don't market for that. Uh, but you know, we have done schools here and there. They're very, very seldom. And that is because it's them reaching out to us and asking us. And we're like, you know, you're, it's, it's, it gets nice to give back to local community. It's a business owner. I always feel should give back to locals. Um, Sean, what about you? Have you, do you do schools? And if so, have you reached out yet? To the schools down there in Georgia, or yes and no. Um, I'm with Bretley. I will not DJ school functions. Absolutely hate it. That is not my jam. Not my cup of tea. But for photo booths, we do a lot of school stuff. So definitely reaching out when it comes to our photo booth side of things. Um, I will not touch a school dance. You couldn't pay me enough. I will have to say. One of the main reasons we ended up doing like as many elementary school dances as we did in the past year is because my daughter and son ha- are in that age and the PTO of their school reached out. And then we've done some for the same school corporation, which is in our town. So yeah. that's kind of why we ended up there. I don't think I would actually be doing the fifth graders dance if my daughter. I, mean, I did my daughter's this year. Yeah. It, but, my, but my school knew what her school knew what they were getting into. And I'm like, I am not a kid DJ. Let's be very clear. I do weddings. You gotta be so clubs. careful. And so they're like, can you do I'm like, I can play a very clean wedding set, but it's going to be more aimed at the adults, not the kids. And it turned out there. And their one comment was, yeah, the kids ran around like, you know, bats out of hell all over the, the gymnasium. But all the parents were dancing, which is, again, it just shows me I'm <laughs> not relatable to anybody under the age of 21. My wife's a better DJ at those gigs. 
but I was saying yesterday to someone, um, there's been many times where she, she starts to play a song. I go, you really going to play that here? And she goes, it's kids, Bob. And I'm like, they made a kids, Bob version of sexy red. And you wouldn't believe the songs they've there made a- into kids, Bob songs, guys go take a listen. WAP is on kids, Bob WAP. I- I'm not kidding. Just because you changed the words does not make it still filthy. It's still the song about the filthy thing. And kids should not be singing it. Oh, my God. I mean, that is, that is, my 12-year-old yeah, has known the lyrics to shake that since she was five years old. And I sent her back. Her mom sent her to me one day singing Talking Body from Tove Lo. Now we are talking. <laughs> and I'm like, what song is that? So I called her mom up. I'm like, what is she singing? And then she sent me the YouTube. And I'm like, oh, that. Oh, okay. It's on now. And a few days later, when she went back to her mom's, her mom this sends me a text, really, dot, 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 dot. And I sent her singing the entire chorus to shake that from Eminem. <laughs> Talk about fair play. You know, um, speaking of uh, special needs, um, going back to Brentley, like, he does a lot with special needs. I actually do a lot with special needs as well. Like, I actually did a uh, uh, Night to Shine at Iglesia Christian Church this this year and they actually want me back for next year 2025 so it's be just as fun as last year so it's going to be awesome and that's the thing is that you know giving back if you can give back i always believe as a business owner that we should do that and it's little things that if if you're able to do it again you got to be at the financial um uh, stability to do it but if you can yeah. donate something to a school yeah. even they have like a lot of areas they have like you know wish upon a wedding or something like that that they look for uh, people to donate dresses if you can donate a wedding set you know actually go and do a wedding uh dj a wedding you know if you if you're able to do that uh, it gets attached right off a lot of these are C, uh oh, yeah. 501c3 charities uh make sure you talk to your tax consultant um, I always say that because you, you you know there's a lot of things that can cause a lot of headaches, but if you can do it and if it's cool with everything, I would say go ahead and, and contact a charity and see if you can do something. I always try to at least help a couple here and there every year because again it, it's 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 power doing business, it's power doing things, and it makes you feel good. And I don't advertise or anything like that. I I talk about it. We don't advertise. We don't say this or that. It's we treat it no different than any of our clientele. It's we're there to help. And my friends who know me, I'll talk to them about it. But you know, again, it's, it's no different than anything else. But I really feel that as an owner, helping out those people who need a little a helping hand, a hand up, is always great to do. And with that said, we're going to close out this episode of DJ Roundtable. And I was teasing early to uh, Jordan said that he he's going to, have to close out because Tommy's going to leave, or else is going to leave, but. I'm actually going to have Hunter do it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for watching this episode of the DJ Roundtable, and we'll see you all next week. Peace.